This video took far too long to make. No individual or company has been in the place of Valve. Traditionally, those who left the routine to forge their own path were devoured, but founders Mike Harrington and Gabe Newell struck gold twice, and in 2007, were on the path to changing an industry. Of all the innovators I've covered so far, none have been as influential, and nothing encapsulates this company's legacy better than their momentous collection. The orange box is a tale of convergence, in part due to Valve's meticulous detail and seal of quality having revealed its flaws. At the end of 2004, Valve only released two Half-Life games. There was great success in multiplayer spinoffs such as Day of Defeat, Team Fortress, and Counter-Strike, but in terms of progress made internally, development cycles weren't desirable. Both Half-Lives received overwhelming praise by critics and fans, but judging from Valve's efforts afterward, a serious toll was taken on its makers. Easy to understand when other franchises ran their course in the span it took Valve to make a single game. For as much as one can believe in quality over quantity, the trajectory of Valve's development only worsened with time. Drastic measures needed to be taken, and that's when the convergence started. Each game within the orange box is unique, not just in its story or gameplay, but also its development. The cycles range from two years to nearly a decade. Developers were modders, graduated students, and industry veterans. Intellectual properties were firmly established, dearly beloved, and making their first impression with gamers. But chronologically, there's only one place to start. Team Fortress 2 had the most radical evolution of the bunch. What ended up as a cartoony team-based shooter began as a military FPS, subtitled Brotherhood of Arms, featuring a slew of gameplay innovations that'll sound familiar. It was to have a commander mode, with one player observing the entire level, dropping items and orders to assist their team, just like Battlefield 2, parachuting into the map, like Battlegrounds, D-Day beach landings, along with an attack and defense mode with preparation phases, like Rainbow Six Siege. Assembled during the end of the 20th century, the developers implemented techniques to optimize and create a more immersive experience, like blending animations and graphics that adjusted in quality as you played. It was years ahead of its time. While Counter-Strike would go on to popularize resources, recoil, and real-world weapons, Brotherhood of Arms was poised to ignite the large-scale military warfare craze. But ultimately, that's not what the developers wanted. They did not envision what we now understand a war shooter to be. The desire was for classes to be completely distinct from one another, and the realistic style, while unique at the time, isolated the developers. Perhaps it's a blessing that the team was doubtful and frustrated rather than attached, because Valve's rapidly aging Gold Source engine, along with their new technology making Team Fortress 2's animation and texture innovations obsolete, resulted in Brotherhood of Arms being canned after 2000. Most canceled projects in the industry lead to layoffs or adjustments within a company's structure, but the TF2 developers were able to keep going, and outside of the public eye, crafted new versions. It's unknown just how many builds of the game there are, but one has been dug up, seemingly in prototype. With an art style that to modernize is similar to Brink or Dishonored, Team Fortress 2 swapped the Brotherhood of Arms subtitle for Invasion, retaining BOA's grittiness with a more exaggerated appearance to complement the gameplay. In interviews with designer Robin Walker, it's said that 8 to 10 art styles were examined to find what worked best with their carnage. It's unknown if Invasion was one of these or if the visual test came after, but it's logical that this is what led to the visuals which appeared in the final product. And the benefits weren't just in gameplay. 
Not striving for photorealism meant the designers focused more on a level's design, rather than its fidelity or believability, and it complemented Valve's catalog of games. Invasion's art style may have been just as exaggerated, but its gritty tone was not unlike the Half-Life series. Knowing what accompanied it and Team Fortress in the orange box, it's a decision that only got better with time. Time that was starting to treat Valve with some grace. The company suffered a monumental blow in 2003 when the source code of Half-Life 2 was leaked online. Employees spent half a decade of their lives innovating, iterating, and implementing, only for all the work to debut in an unfinished state because of one person. One person who was eventually arrested, in large part thanks to Valve's community assisting them and the FBI. But by 2005, things were starting to change. Half-Life 2, Lost Coast, Deathmatch, Counter-Strike Source, and Day of Defeat Source were all out by 2005, and there was more going on behind the scenes. Half-Life 2 went through many changes over its grueling development, but the big culprit behind its years of work was to do with Valve's technology, and the idea of immediately leaving Source to forge new tools didn't hold merit. But that's what would be expected with a supposed Half-Life 3, as it's the bar Half-Life 2 set for the franchise. At this point, Valve were developing an expansion, Half-Life 2 Aftermath, but doing so was still following convention. Successful PC games often received expansions in order to make a profit within a shorter time frame. But Valve's goals had to do with addressing all of the challenges they faced with Half-Life 2. It's important to highlight that while the intrusion of their servers was a major blow to the company, it had a greater deflation of morale over productivity. Had the event never occur, Valve still faced disputes with their publisher, locking development for physical release, and targeting hardware years in advance. Half-Life 2 would have been pushed to November 2004, no matter what. With this in mind, to evolve their expansion into one of an episodic trilogy, roughly scheduled for release every six months, is almost self-explanatory. In this format, Valve would make a profit consistently rather than once every few years. Steam allowed them to avoid publishers who'd hinder their progress, and Half-Life would get content regularly. So, Half-Life 2 Aftermath, scheduled for a summer 2005 release, was delayed to March 2006, redubbed Episode 1, with Valve starting four separate teams devoted to producing future episodes and other single-player projects. Not far from Valve's offices in Washington is the DigiPen Institute of Technology, a university that prides itself on computer science, engineering, and game design. Every year concludes with an expo for graduating students who are able to showcase their work to developers, such as Robin Walker. One of the most notable games stumbled upon was Narbacular Drop. What sounded like a Nickelodeon production turned out to be one of the biggest advancements for portal technology in gaming. Released a year before Prey achieved a similar concept but in fixed locations, this student project gave players total control over two portals they could place anywhere in the level. The students thought after Robin left a business card that they might get some advice and emailed the Valve veteran just prior to submitting the game for a contest. Instead, Valve invited the graduates to further demo their work at Valve's offices, where Gabe Newell offered the team to make this game in the Source Engine 15 minutes into their presentation. As Valve were recovering from multiple development slogs, the students were speechless, finding themselves employed immediately after graduation instead of on the streets. Work was brisk, Pre-production, which took a large chunk of Half-Life 2's development, didn't repeat, as the team's earliest days were about learning the Source engine instead of building it, with the exception of the portals themselves. Traditionally, game development is a lengthy process because all systems and mechanics need to be built and tested individually before they mesh. Levels can't be built if what they contain isn't functional. But unlike the in-depth classes of Team Fortress 2 or the AI and set pieces of Half-Life 2, Portal's formula was staggeringly simple. Once the team coded portals into Source Engine, nearly all the remaining elements could be built off of Valve's work, reusing turrets, energy, and sound effects from Half-Life 2. All of the game's test chambers were designed within the first year, with shocking resemblance to the final product. Valve's goal of releasing Half-Life episodes on a frequent basis had already failed at this point, but without discouraging the company. Team Fortress 2 was finally on track to being completed. Episode 1 left people desperate for more, and Portal's gameplay was unlike anything else on the market. Valve was confident in each of their upcoming games, and now the problem to tackle was marketing and distribution. How would three games released at the same time come from one company without consequence? The answer was revealed that of all things, an EA press conference. Without any news prior, Gabe Newell took to the stage of EA's Summer Showcase event in 2006, 
to announce Half-Life 2's latest episode, Team Fortress 2, Portal, and that all were coming to consoles thanks to the EA Partners division. Slated for release in the 2006 holiday season, it came as a surprise to nobody that Valve delayed their games, and by Q1 2007, pushed them back to Fall 2007, under a new packaging scheme. In past videos, I've looked at story, gameplay, and conclusions individually, because that's how many video games are designed. They have formulas which are repeated throughout. To use Mass Effect 1 as an example, it has three modes of interaction that rotate on a regular basis. Combat, conversation, and exploration. In the case of this particular game, none of these aspects may have enough depth to endure a multi-hour epic, but when combined, make for a compelling experience. This is in contrast to the genre of first-person shooters, which are traditionally focused on one element. From Doom to Halo and Fear is a connective tissue of being superb at this one thing. Whether it's Quake or Counter-Strike, their experience is built to loop the maps, weapons, and tactics where navigating and mastering all is the hook. As Halo's designer famously said, If you can get 30 seconds of fun, you can pretty much stretch that out to be an entire game. And this is what makes Half-Life 2 unique. Because it doesn't have 30 seconds of fun stretched out to be an entire game. In fact, it might not even have 30 seconds of fun at all. Okay, I wrote that because I get a kick out of triggering people. What I mean to say is when compared to the games I mentioned, Half-Life 2 isn't nearly as exciting or in-depth, yet it's considered to be one of the best games ever made. So I think it's important to address its weaker aspects, as they'll lead into what's great. Even reviews at the time which granted near-perfect scores only described Half-Life 2's combat as solid, with vague descriptions and highlighting a few set pieces. That's because there's not really much for a critic to work off of when you strip it down. Every shooter has a few levels that use a minimal layout and put the weight of engagement on its gameplay loop. Arenas such as the copy and pasted rooms in Halo or the factories of fear. Half-Life 2 is no exception, and during levels that lack grand context, unique visuals, or gameplay mechanics, you're left with a few enemy types and grounded weapons with ammo and health management. The industry's over-reliance on Halo's mechanics has kept the style of gameplay retroactively engrossing. But excusing physics or visuals, there's little advancement in Half-Life 2 from its predecessor. And as been pointed out by fans for years, there's multiple areas that have regressed, chiefly in enemies and weapons. Half-Life's limited technology leads to soldiers who move like they've got treads and levels that are more barren than a nun's porn collection. But there was a real emphasis on movement. That's because the enemy's design punished you for remaining still. Marines would throw grenades and aggressively push while you took cover. Vortigaunts charged up heavy bolt attacks. Bull squid spat acid, and hound eyes rushed you with shockwaves. All of these, combined with the high movement speed, encouraged players to be on their feet. Despite Half-Life's unremarkable shooting mechanics, these elements kept the action fast and fluid. Whereas Half-Life 2 combines greatly reduced movement speed with enemies wielding hitscan firearms in fixed locations, you can guess what this encourages. The Combine have distinct chatter and sound effects that seamlessly assist in gameplay, such as the flatlining heartbeat but they rarely demonstrate the sort of tactics you'd expect from this series. Routinely, they'll exhibit the all-too-common trope of zombie-like creatures who will throw away their life just to chip at your health bar. They do still throw grenades and push like Marines did, but with slower movement and reaction time, so the only Combine soldiers that catch you off guard are the Elites wielding shotguns. Except for some reason, their Spaz-12 is able to fire at a much higher rate than yours, making these enemies feel distinctively cheap. Your mileage may vary, but I found the Combine have a real habit of bunching up into groups, typically when they first spawn, making it easy to wipe them out with one hit from the SMG's grenade launcher. There isn't a sense these Overwatch soldiers are people during battle. One of the benefits of sections like Ravenholm or Highway 17 is zombies and antlions are much easier to suspend your disbelief for. The erratic behavior of the latter is similar to a wild animal, and zombies are creatures who crave their next taste of brain matter. The Combine are modified by an alien race, but they're still human, and one of the great things about Half-Life 2 is how effectively it conveys the power dynamic of citizens and their oppressors. The Combine have a tragic quality in that the Civil Protectors and Overwatch soldiers are potentially just people who are tired of being on the wrong side of the fence, but this characterization doesn't suit their behavior in combat. However, that's not to suggest that all the faults rest on the Combine's shoulders. The weapon selection isn't terrible and has its share of satisfaction. 
The shotgun's alt fire is gratifying, the crossbow complements Val's physics, and the SMG, while weak, sounds fantastic. And there's Half-Life 2's claim to fame, the gravity gun. This physics-based wonder weapon, however, not only stands out because of its unique application, but also because the rest of the arsenal isn't nearly as versatile. The USP is discarded by most the instant an SMG is picked up. The revolver and crossbow ultimately have the same job of picking people off at range. The pulse rifle secondary is inferior to the SMG's launcher, and the only explosives you get are grenades in the RPG. Not only is Half-Life's selection larger, it's more useful. The Glock's pinpoint accuracy makes it good for clearing weak enemies and objectives at range. The crossbow could be used underwater where the revolver couldn't. You had satchel charges and laser mines to complement your standard explosives, along with an entire category of weapons cleave from the sequel. And that's not including the superb additions made in Opposing Force. And let's clear this up before going any further. Half-Life is a game I didn't play until years after completing its sequel, and I've only finished it once, so this isn't coming from the mouth of a diehard fan who grew up with the original game. I'm more fascinated than frustrated by Half-Life 2's approach to making a sequel. One that removes just as many things as it adds with altered visuals and retcon characters is similar to the current craze of requels, and is beloved where most are at least controversial. That's where we get to the good of Half-Life 2, and back to the original question. How does a shooter with average at best combat, while backtracking from its predecessor, be regarded so highly? Well, these are multiple levels from Doom, Halo, and Fear. Meanwhile, this is Half-Life 2's. Reusing assets isn't something to frown upon inherently. In fact, when implemented well, it's great game design. Time is money, and if you're able to reuse something rather than bleeding your budget dry, it should be encouraged. But a problem that comes up with visual sounds or pieces of music is that it can reduce the impact of its intended effect. The more you see or hear something, the less it grabs your attention. It's the reason I talk about game scores by their individual tracks and implementation. Halo CE's music is iconic, but the way certain tracks are reused out of necessity make them less poignant. And the same can be said of levels. No matter what's done, playing earlier stages backwards, for example, doesn't match the feeling of wonder and discovery a new location gives you. This is Half-Life 2's specialty, and it's the area that truly expands on the original game. Having not touched Half-Life 2 for years, or playing through it countless times as I have with Mass Effect and Halo, very little was forgotten in that time. City 17, Ravenholm, Highway 17, Nova Prospect, The Citadel. No location blends in with the rest both through gameplay and storytelling. But it's not just their distinction, it's the order and how one chapter leads into the next. The opening effortlessly immerses the player in its world with perfectly selected visuals and audio cues. There's no music, immediate crime, or extreme violence. Instead, there's believable NPCs and a boatload of implications. Similar to Half-Life 1, Half-Life 2's premise has been thoroughly explored in any art form. But just like Half-Life 1, it doesn't feel derivative because the storytelling is so effectively shown, rather than told. You know Breen is the head of City 17, and your antagonist just from his placement. You know the aliens aren't only oppressing humans. And this storytelling is constant. By the time you've got the USP, you find monitors are used in combat, resistance members are scattered throughout the city, and that even headcrabs are a tool of the Combine, and rarely with any dialogue. The opening chapters aren't a single thing. They're equal parts seamless tutorial, combat, and exploration. I do feel the airboat sequence is one that could have been cut down or feature a more involved design. As is, there's not much for the player to do but stomp on the gas. And the vehicle doesn't have a sense of speed due to how wide the canal is. But ultimately, I'd still leave it in because it's the necessary piece that connects Act 1 to 2. Valve could have placed Ravenholm next to City 17 and transitioned the player from here to here but a key to Half-Life 2's enjoyment is its tangible progression. Having to travel to Black Mesa East yourself accomplishes multiple things. It gives the player ample time to become proficient with the mechanics, establishes the Combine's outreach and that you're their biggest threat, sets up the Resistance's organization, believably shifts from day to night, and allows the next story beat to occur just after the player's fatigue from combat, making these scenes desirable where they otherwise might be tedious. Even a sequence that I'd argue is the weakest of all still benefits Half-Life 2 as a whole. 
and the tedium of this airboat sequence is something that's never felt again after its completion. Ravenholm is fondly remembered by gamers because of its tone of horror over science fiction, the use of the gravity gun, and the character of Father Grigori. But all of that is amplified by lasting for just a single chapter. The brightest star lives half as long. The Coast that follows is an example of how Half-Life 2 manages to transition things like wide open countryside driving with an alien prison break seamlessly. Firstly, your objective's location has been subliminally mentioned several times prior. The player may not know of Nova Prospect directly, but they've had several hours to understand its significance. And second, the ant lines are introduced with a layer of safety, that being the buggy. You get to understand their attack patterns and behavior before jumping into a pit against them. Valve plant these seeds for the player regularly. When you've completed your drive and proceed on foot, the level design in sand traps never changes, but the way you use it does. Players begin slowly traversing, either from taking time to jump from platform to platform, and that's when you're thrown a curveball in the form of bug bait. The ability to use ant lions as allies. And that's when the level goes from vast and threatening to liberating. Half-Life 2 is a textbook example of pacing in video games. By the time you've fought through city streets and massacre the combine with your enhanced gravity gun, it truly feels like you've been on an adventure, experiencing every sight, sound, and foe in this world. The quality of each level's design or gimmick may vary with plenty to criticize, but for me, the real problem with Half-Life 2 is its commitment to the narrative. That sounds counterintuitive, so bear with me. Gordon Freeman is often considered a great character despite not having any. That's because in Half-Life 1, he was truly a vessel for the player. Is he a terrified scientist? A proficient warrior? A bloodthirsty psychopath? Yes. He's any and or all of these because Valve accounted for it. You could murder every Black Mesa employee left alive and the game would not only accept it, but there would be short-term benefits for doing so, most infamously killing the first Barney you see in order to get the pistol early. We could also try to save everyone on Black Mesa with benefits for doing that too, like weapon caches that allowed you to stockpile gear. These decisions may not be profound, but they were tangible. Tangibility is one of Valve's biggest pursuits. It's what feels everything from the art style to the physics engine. There's no logical reason to have employees spend their hours programming seagulls to defecate on your vehicle, only the desire to make Half-Life seem like a potential reality. But Valve were following a trajectory. Their NPCs went from being all enemies in the original build of Half-Life to featuring allies because users started to care about them. Half-Life 2 wanted to enhance their empathy, and they succeeded. In 2004, only Metal Gear Solid 3 could compete in physical expression and body language. Where powerhouses such as Doom 3 featured characters seemingly made out of clay, Half-Life 2's cast had a much closer resemblance to actual people. Valve hunted for Hollywood talent, worked with doctors to come up with the right catalog of facial expressions, and even wrote up full character profiles for the main cast. This is all very impressive. Lots of attention and care was taken, even more so than Half-Life 1, but it came at a cost. This sequel originally carried the predecessor's design of having allies that could die, but with a narrative that was defined by your actions rather than indifferent, and having scenes require certain characters to be present, Valve reversed their decision and wouldn't allow Gordon to be free. This choice is understandable as the workload on display is very commendable, but I can't help but feel there was a missed opportunity to advance what Half-Life started rather than change it. Just imagine if Alex's death didn't trigger a game over screen and it was something you had to live with. It had the potential to make a scene with Eli Vance be more impactful with the loss of his daughter. But the blunder against Valve's decision to make NPCs immune to player attacks is how much it confuses Gordon Freeman's role, as he's no longer an avatar that the player shapes in their image, but an actual character, with no voice, personality, or meaningful backstory. It only gets weirder when people behave like friends of Gordon despite this never being on display in the original game, or how Mossman is familiar with Freeman's work before Black Mesa when he was just a recent hire who wore a suit and pushed carts. In fairness, this line of dialogue lacks proper context due to cut content. In the beta, Eli mentions you were hired over Mossman for the job at Black Mesa. Fine scientist, Judith. She would have been at Black Mesa if our budget hadn't been so tight. But you edged her out in light of your work at Innsbruck. It could have been her in the test chamber that day. I'm also not faulting Valve entirely for their decision. It opens a whole can of worms in a game that was already innovating in so many fields. I'm just lamenting the loss of an opportunity to push FPS design through Half-Life's foundations, rather than changing one of its core principles. 
Something else I lament is a lack of level streaming in the Source Engine that results in you seeing these. On a modern PC, the load times are fast, but still akin to someone constantly pausing a film. And I'm hopeful for an update to Source 2. Were it to have seamless transitions such as Dark Souls, the pacing would be superior. Yo. Talk about Dark Souls and I'll fucking cut you, coward. I... Hmm... Were it to have seamless transitions like No Man's Sky, the pacing would be superior to what's already superb. But that's all about what Half-Life 2 could be. In terms of what it is, the game has endured over a decade of evolution remarkably. Nothing else has managed to inherit this game's variety and levels and the subtlety of its transitions between them. It isn't really a game whose age has created problems that wouldn't be acceptable in a modern game. Most of what's wrong with Half-Life 2 was there from day one. The combat was never very impressive, and the retractions from Half-Life were a disappointment. I understand where people who don't care for this game are coming from, because if the combat doesn't excite, and the world and characters don't intrigue you, then its meticulous pacing and variety isn't going to compel everyone. Hard mode is an absolute must, and it's still relatively unchallenging, but at least carries some consequence for running around like an idiot, which normal doesn't have. I don't believe Half-Life 2 is the greatest game of all time, and I don't believe it ever was, nor do I really care. There's such a large variety of games on the market, it's not worth trying to objectively put one above everything else. What matters is if Half-Life 2 achieves what it strives for, even today, and I believe it does. In a year of phenomenal sequels, Half-Life 2 still managed to be one of the most accredited games released, and it's one that any video game player should experience for themselves, along with its episodes. This is the expansion pack turned episode that sparked the next generation of Half-Life content. Valve's first attempt with their new release model is one that's regarded well by critics at the time, but hasn't received much discussion, and I believe that's indicative of its content and how games are remembered. When Half-Life 2 is brought up in conversation, it's more than likely about Ravenholm, Nova Prospect, or the Citadel, not the apartment fights or combine outposts. The most unique levels and set pieces are talked about over core gameplay, and that's true for most video games. But in the case of Episode 1, that's unfortunate, because its opening and ending are anticlimactic slogs that stick out in the player's mind. Meanwhile, its moment-to-moment -moment combat and level design has been refined, making for gameplay that's more enjoyable than Half-Life 2. The opening has some very endearing moments with Alex and Dog, but once you're back in the Citadel, it can test one's patience. Getting the supercharged gravity gun in Half-Life 2 was effective because it capped off the game with the most powerful weapon. You went from picking off combined soldiers with standard firearms behind cover to vaporizing them in an instant. Players had the contrast and context of being a citizen in the confined apartments of City 17 to appreciate the colossal interiors of the Citadel. Episode 1 lacks this climactic buildup and as a result, its gameplay doesn't have that excitement to start with. There's also the greater presence of dialogue scenes. Alex's likability in the openings exchanged for dumping exposition and setting up the storyline of Episode 2. Her more personal lines are what keep the scenes inoffensive, but it's hard to not get frustrated at how often you're waiting for her. Half-Life 2's dialogue scenes were discreetly placed after a slew of exhaustive battles and gave the player multiple things to explore if they weren't listening to the dialogue explicitly. This doesn't translate to Episode 1. The best part of the Citadel is what it hints at for the rest of the gameplay. In Half-Life 2, combat was at its best when it wasn't just the player versus the Combine. Because Episode 1 features Alex as a teammate with improved AI, it mostly avoids repeating Half-Life 2's dullest encounters. On top of this, arenas with antlions require the player to physically prevent their invasion, via blocking underground pits with vehicles. The player takes in the environment. Rather than just hunting down targets, a window of opportunity needs to be created. It's much more involving and therefore engaging, along with Episode 1's hard mode being more satisfying. It's not easy to tell if the Combine are smarter, better placed, or do slightly more damage, but battles require more persistence and tactics, though you can still cheese them. The best levels are two which include the Combine fighting antlions or zombies. Not only does it look and sound fantastic with all the effects, but once again involves the player. There's real strategy in deciding which enemies take priority and even using specific types against each other. Zombines are the only new addition, but their design of a beefy target who kamikazes is intimidating, yet useful at times. 
And then there's Alex who can cover you, take down enemies in CQC, and serves to add levity to the game's dark and forbidding tone. I'll talk about Half-Life 2's characters in its second episode, but Alex is the easiest to empathize and connect with. Before, it was because of her personality, but in episode one, it's because she's genuinely helpful and believable. The way she navigates the world seems closer to that of a person living in this world, compared to the desperate charges of the Combine. Though that's not to suggest the AI in episode one doesn't have its deficiencies. By and large, this game is one of the reasons I decided to present this analysis as a video rather than a series. While the core gameplay may be improved from Half-Life 2, as we've discussed, that wasn't the reason people revered it. The mission design and pacing was, and Episode 1's campaign feels much more by the book. Rather than each chapter being completely distinct in its challenges and gameplay mechanics, they're broken up into layers. The first being locations, the Citadel and City 17 and the second is gameplay that rotates between puzzles, combat, and clashes. For as enjoyable as each are and are placed intelligently, nothing reaches the distinction of Ravenholm or Nova Prospect. The closest moment to a set piece here is the climax, and it's one of the weakest in Valve's history. The player is tasked with escorting multiple groups from one interior to a train station with combine forces interrupting your progress. Escort quests are rarely satisfying, but since Alex became a welcome companion, there's potential. Unfortunately, it quickly fractures the storytelling Half-Life is known for, with an objective that exists only to create a gameplay scenario. The first group you lead is free of enemy forces. This is done to get players familiar with the level and allow them to safely navigate before dealing with a combine. There's just one problem. Well, that wasn't so hard. We should have brought everyone over at once. Yes, we should have. Gordon, Alex, or Barney could have scouted and give out a signal for the all clear. This level exchanges believability for justifying its existence and what results is an emotionless finale that's supposed to be humanity's final steps in City 17. Now, it's not complete teeter-totter design as the level pits you against an array of enemies, vehicles, weapons, and destruction to the environment. But with Alex staying behind and the lack of puzzle solving during combat, this section relies on Half-Life 2's basic gameplay the most. But what rightfully left a sour taste in everyone's mouth is the final fight against a Strider. The synth, known for its slim mobility, confines itself within the station, despite having a wide open entrance to attack where you're actually escorting people from, instead of waiting for Alex. Viewed under the lens of a Half-Life 2 expansion pack, Episode 1 doesn't have much ground to stand on, making incremental improvements to its graphics, AI, and level design without the powerful additions of opposing force. But Valve tend to forecast the industry, so what Episode 1 actually feels like are the epilogue DLCs most popular with EA games, but I'm sure that's just a coincidence. And when compared to things like Mass Effect 2 Arrival, it actually holds up pretty well with gameplay that's been effectively tweaked rather than downgraded. As I've described in prior videos, some games have extensions rather than expansions, and Episode 1 is a solid example of the former. Combined with Half-Life 2 accompanying the Orange Box's new content, it meant that it was the perfect time for newcomers to jump in. Just like Half-Life 2, Episode 2's impression is shaped by its lack of such at the beginning. Picking up immediately from its predecessor, it immediately repeats mistakes. There's an inherent drawback to making episodes that aren't within a singular experience, and that's having to account for the potential of it being someone's introduction to the series, meaning you have to teach them the basic controls and avoid any immediate action. Episode 2 is much more efficient in bringing players up to speed, but it's disappointing that none of the Half-Life games have immediately compelling introductions. The long build-up in the original was unique at the time and set up Black Mesa. But not only have other games made this innovation a cliché, it's become predictable in Half-Life at this point. It feels less like tradition and more a lack of originality. But Episode 2 isn't about innovating, it's about iterating, and nowhere is this more evident than your time spent in the caves. Alex is wounded in a scripted sequence and sustained by one of the Vortigaunts, where you're subsequently brought into a rock shelter packed with antlions. What takes place is a completely predictable wave defense sequence that fits perfectly within FPS cliches. And yet, it's one of the best sequences in the campaign. Typically, when games fall back on wave defense, it's the pad for time. In games like Warframe, it's acceptable because it has missions dedicated for using this framework to level and loot, whereas story missions in the original Destiny were not due to over-reliance. Unlike Episode 1's repeated use of the antlion pits, this defense sequence is never duplicated. There's four tunnels to hold off by yourself and two NPCs. To make up for being outnumbered, you're given two turrets and multiple mines. 
Early waves come from a single location and they're so painless you can just pick up a turret and point in the vague direction of your enemies. But even here, the game is teaching you things. The second wave doesn't come from this tunnel next to the first. It's the punctured entrance with a different layout and size compared to the rest. Information that needs to be known when each wave starts to build up. Mines are depleted. Turrets are knocked down. Leaps are made. You go from viewing to participating with shotgun in hand. And just when you've been pushed to the brink, Vortigaunt show up and the music kicks in. Everything about the sequence in game design, audio, and visuals is constructed to make this final wave as thrilling as possible. Half-Life 2's average combat is given such an expertly crafted section that the level's simplicity doesn't register in the moment. On paper, it's just like any other game, but in execution, it's what makes Half-Life special to this day. And speaking of the score, that leads into something else Half-Life has all to itself. I adore the music of Halo, Mass Effect, or Deus Ex, but they fit into genres such as orchestral or electronic. But Half-Life is unlike any other shooter, both in its sound and usage. The closest are industrial artists such as Nine Inch Nails or Frontline Assembly, groups who have had their own impact in video games. But where Trent Reznor uses the sounds made to explore darker themes compared to most popular artists, Half-Life's composer Kelly Bailey uses the sound at very specific moments to complement the world. That's likely due to him being in charge of the game's audio, creating all the sound effects and systems used to run them. Being intimately familiar with every weapon, creature, and level, it's small wonder how Bailey so effectively adds music on top of his creations. Not having a separate composer is what probably led to the music's rarity. If you spent years creating and layering a world sonically, you wouldn't overrule all that work with music unless your creativity called for it. The rarity of tracks makes their presence that much more impactful. When only a third of your combat encounters are fought with music, it'll heighten anyone's excitement. And in the case of Episode 2, it may contain the best of Kelly Bailey's career. This leads into what I mentioned earlier about iteration. The sequence where this song plays is actually a retread of the airboat chase from Half-Life 2, only swapping vehicles and concluding on foot. But the music setting and character interactions that are completely unique to this game separate it from Half-Life 2 in execution and for the better. This improvement is across the board, which is where hunters come in. The Combine's hitscan weapons and basic movements have been averted with a unique alien skeleton, immense strength, and deadly projectiles. Not only are their explosive flechettes avoidable, they accompany Half-Life 2's mechanics exquisitely. The gravity gun could always be used for protection, but Combine were so weak that it was easier to throw explosives at them or right-click with a shotgun. But for Hunters, their explosive rounds allow your defense to become offensive. These flechettes have a brief idle period before they explode, allowing the player to pick up objects, tank rounds, and hurl them at the enemy. The Hunter's strength also gives much more weight to your rocket launcher and pulse rifle energy, as both can quickly take care of them but are limited in ammunition. This enemy is so well designed that, frankly, there's only one major fault with it, and that's they're as weak to car bumpers as aliens are to Commander Shepard. These creatures can withstand a Texan's ammo supply, but are instantly killed upon a rusted hunk of metal traveling at 10 miles per hour. It's one of the reasons I think the game's climax hasn't aged well. Hunters are the only Combine enemies you battle directly, and your car is more powerful than any rocket launcher, leaving you free to take down each Strider. Some may argue to simply not use the vehicle to kill Hunters, but unfortunately, that's only one problem with the climactic battle. This series is linear, but their beauty is the freedom they allow within each limited space, a sort of mini sandbox. And despite Episode 2's scope being ambitious, the ending's illusion is shattered quite easily. I can't in good heart fault its lack of NPCs and enemies. That can be blamed on the restriction of console hardware and limited system requirements in 2007. What can be faulted are the multiple outposts that magically respawn health and ammunition instead of having to keep track of the supplies you're draining. 
The Striders don't confront you as they did in Half-Life 2 either, acting almost indifferent to your presence unless you stop directly in front of them. And the level's destruction is scripted to the T, with certain Striders charging for one base in particular before progressing again at a normal speed. Thankfully, the game doesn't make them invincible, so you can kill them. But, each Strider afterward proceeds to ignore the structure you protected, unless they happen to stumble upon it. There isn't an authentic dynamic here. Fond memories of this level can't overpower the immense tedium I felt while playing. It's not as blatantly rushed out the door as Episode 1's conclusion, but it's just as unexciting. The ending of Episode 2 didn't clutch gamers' hearts because of gameplay. It was what it did to one of the characters. Which is our final subject in regards to Half-Life. Half-Life 2 committed to establishing major characters who couldn't be killed unless the plot called for it. Not only was this design ubiquitous across the industry, Half-Life 2's play and narrative didn't really justify it, in Episode 1 even less so. With Half-Life 2, Valve finally began to take advantage of their choices. Alex's critical wound is rather cheap, but it leads to an excellent scene with the G-Man in a way that makes sense. Half-Life is best with implication, and the G-Man's reveal of interfering with Vance's life in front of you is laced with intent. Episode 1 is the first time G-Man doesn't lecture you directly, but Episode 2 is the first time he does it willingly. Every other speech in the series is all about Freeman and how he benefits the G-Man and his employers, but Episode 2 is when he talks about meddling with other people's lives to you, rather than in the distance. I couldn't help but notice at the end of Half-Life 2 the way he looks at Alex. It could have been coincidental, until discovering another cut line of dialogue. We were living in base housing, you know. When I made it back there right before the end, I found only Alex. She had her mother's wedding ring in her hand, but she couldn't tell me how she'd gotten it. Those days are blank for her. Sometimes I wish it were the same for me. I can still only guess what might have happened to my wife. Saving this mystery until later was absolutely for the best. Without question, the G-Men and Alex are the highlights of this game's cast. The likability and dependability of Miss Vance and the mystery of the G-Men is rarely matched in gaming. But if there's one thing that can be said of the cast is their lack of complexity, which isn't inherently a problem. Not every character in every story needs to change for the story to be good. What it needs is writing and a plot to make the most of their talents, and that's where the Half-Life 2 series hesitates. I've already mentioned the retcon characters, which adds to the bitter pill of your allies and antagonists in one sector of Europe being Black Mesa employees. But more than the absurdity, which can be overlooked, there's a lack of not only conflict, but choices characters make. The reason Alex and Dog are the most beloved NPCs is in large part to making decisions that inform us of their character. There's nothing like this from Dr. Kleiner, Eli, or Barney. In Half-Life 2, they exist to fill a quota and do a job by demand of the script. Be the leader that gets captured. Be the fighter who helps the resistance. Be the dork that acts as a door opener. Episode 2 is when the series really starts to intrigue and uses its existing characters to spark debate, with Eli and Kleiner being on opposite ends of the scientific mind due to the events that they both experienced. This is interesting. It's using a combination of future and previous events to show who these people are. And because they're talking, you don't suffer from the awkwardness of being a silent protagonist that characters speak to. Even that's done better here. Alex has environment-specific interactions, such as throwing health packs during the chopper battle, or commenting on weapons you found. And Eli is finally talking to the player about the G-Men and other relevant matters, rather than just using Gordon's silence as a punchline. That is, until you encounter Magnuson. The character who encompasses almost everything wrong with Half-Life 2's approach to characters and dialogue. Following an archetype just as cliched as prior characters with a personality only a mother could love. And that's because he exists to dig Valve out of their own hole. Originally, Eli and Kleiner were the ones that kickstarted White Forest after escaping City 17 and the writers knew this was nonsense. So, they used the opportunity to repeat what they did before, by retconning another NPC from Black Mesa. Oh, and Freeman, if you pull this off, I might just forgive you for that debacle at Black Mesa. You know the one I mean, involving a certain microwave casserole. Personally, lines like these only get worse with time, because the less I buy them as things people would say, and more is taking the easy road. Not that I mean to overblow this issue, speaking as someone who used XD out of desperation at four in the morning. And we likely would have seen the other side of Magnuson hinted at towards the finale, were the series to continue. Finally, 
The cliffhanger ending is better off with Eli's scenes that finally reference Half-Life's greater events and mystery outside of Easter eggs, but the character people really care for is Alex. Through the time spent, players are able to empathize with her sadness, while the actress ends with authentic desperation and Bailey's music concludes. Oh my god. Valve's centerpiece of the Orange Box was a six-hour second chapter continuation of a three-year-old game, and Half-Life was speculated, debated, and talked about for a decade. That's the impact this series had, and revisiting Episode 2 makes me feel it's well-deserved. Not because it's perfect, but because it compelled, it hooked, it effortlessly made those who played it desperate for more. Episode 2 doesn't quite have the variety of Half-Life 2, but everything that game did, Episode 2 does better, from enemy and level design to character and storytelling. Valve's ability to utilize basic scripting, linear levels, and average combat and turn them into experiences that are remembered to this very day speaks volumes of their talents. These were Valve's veterans continuing to push their expertise, but at any company, there's going to be a time for new blood. Portal is a very difficult game to critically view under a retrospective lens, because unlike, for instance, Counter-Strike, its gameplay isn't made to be an endless loop. Half-Life 2's combat might not be extraordinary, but you can put yourself in a house, spawn Combine, and have a dynamic experience. Portal doesn't work like that. I can't play this game and experience what 07 Racevic did. He spent hours solving what I now complete in seconds just from memory. I've realized, however, this speaks volume to how effectively Portal instructs the player. It invented a 3D puzzle mechanic, and it's THE game to use as an introduction to 3D video games as a whole. Thinking with portals used to be a marketing line. Now, it's common knowledge within the gaming community. And that is absolutely an achievement. Test Chambers 1-17 through 17 is one of the most seamless, elegant, and crucially entertaining tutorials out there, leading the player one step at a time from learning about portals in static, to in motion, in hand, and in total control. YouTubers have delved into the fastidious design of each chamber, and it's true. Every window, visual cue, or door has an explicit intent. When introducing a new mechanic, it's often best to frame it in familiarity. Platforms, switches, and generators are common concepts for people to understand the portal gun's use. The coherent pacing and progression of gameplay is what you'd expect from Valve's seal of quality, but in a genre Valve never partook in. Puzzles in their games were always used to break up pacing, never to carry an experience and as part of a complete package, it complements the orange box. Experienced gamers get to witness a new mechanic. Newcomers to the medium overcome their own struggles rather than aliens, and those looking for Valve's storytelling and atmosphere are treated. The moment you've woken up, the game incorporates a locked cell, countdown, ironic music, safety glass, and a glitchy sarcastic robot, combining for a sense of unease. You have the confidence to continue through each chamber while knowing there's something brewing out of your sight, but unlike many games that think so little of their players to treat this as a revelation, Portal lays down its cards by Chamber 16. The player's first look behind the curtain happens to be the moment you're pitted against sentry turrets. It begins a set of chambers that are more adversarial, while you stumble upon more of these rat dens, hinting at the bigger picture. The clean-cut aesthetic is built upon industrial rust and tear, where visual cues are the frantic markings of a madman rather than printed signs. The framework around Portal is what makes it a gaming classic. Akin to Half-Life, the story doesn't blow your mind with world-changing twists or complex characters. It simply lets you explore the narrative as much as you desire, with a subtlety rarely seen. But this framework didn't always exist. Portal evolved greatly with time, but not in its gameplay. There's restoration mods available to the public that allow them to experience what Portal used to be. The chambers are here, with an almost identical layout and utility to the final product, but everything else is missing. Let's re-examine the opening in this recreation of Portal's 2005 build. The visuals emulate Nova Prospect, an atmosphere of despair and danger rather than disingenuous corporate construction. The clock is slow and analog, making the minute drag. The windows are clear, and there's no voice to give context to the player. That's because GLaDOS didn't exist at this point. Portal didn't seem to have a story at all in 2005. The ending features no mention of characters, companies, or constructs. 
It's about breaking out of the facility by fetching batteries for a generator, preventing your exit. Playing these early versions of the test chambers without Portal's framework only reinforced a feeling that's going to get my head put on a stick. Thankfully, it's one that the developers have openly shared, so I can cower behind them. Portal's core is rather barren, or to quote Kim Swift, the game's director, On its own, the gameplay would be alright. Honestly, a little on the dry side. At first, I thought this was simply due to having replayed the game enough times to know the answers to each puzzle, but completing Still Alive brought this line of thinking to a halt. Traditionally speaking, video games teach you all of their mechanics and discovery is replaced with knowledge, the enjoyment of manipulating the world to your will with skill. Portal doesn't have this. Once you've learned every mechanic, the game's almost over, and if you substitute that with new levels provided by mods, you're missing the presence of GLaDOS and the paranoid atmosphere. The monotony isn't from a lack of challenge, it's to do with a lack of decisions in gameplay. Puzzles I never tested before and still alive were completed quickly, not out of my intelligence, but just from pattern recognition and knowing the game's tropes. You see a pit? Use momentum. You see a gap? Shoot a portal. See a cube? Put it on a switch. Portal's real magic isn't from designs that are endless in depth, but the game's flow. Its final chambers solidify this. This being a puzzler, the game's most complex chamber could have easily transitioned to the final test, but it doesn't. Instead, it lets players use the full momentum and speed that the portal gun allows, which also trains them for sections taking place outside of the facility's boundaries. There's no puzzle solving here. Just like the enhanced gravity gun, the intent is to give you a sense of power, and it contrasts beautifully with the serene pace of the test chambers. This pacing is also why GLaDOS is so crucial to Portal's success. Early versions of the game lacked advancement without an antagonist to build towards. Without the gameplay to generate tension or excitement, fiction was burdened with the responsibility. The AI does a wonderful job of presenting the game's levity, with dialogue that accurately strengthens her ill will while making people laugh. The ending actually demonstrates this best. Don't believe me? Here, I'll put you on. Hello. That's you. That's how dumb you sound. You've been wrong about every single thing you've ever done, including this thing. You're not smart. You're not a scientist. You're not a doctor. You're not even a full-time employee. But just as with the rest of the game, there's multiple lines in contrast to this, specifically when she references the world outside of Aperture Science. Are you trying to escape? <laughs> <laughs> Things have changed since the last time you left the building. What's going on out there will make you wish you were back in here. I have an infinite capacity for knowledge, and even I'm not sure what's going on outside. All I know is I'm the only thing standing between us and them. These are the things that make Portal great for what it is. A gateway to gaming. It's one of the few 3D puzzle games out there that isn't explicitly for fans of the genre. Anyone, whether they've played a thousand games or none at all, can pick up Portal and enjoy its simplicity and endearing presentation. It was rightfully explored both by fans and Valve themselves. And while I don't believe it's what makes the orange box, it does complete it. But if Portal is concise in both its development and experience, our final game is the opposite. Unlike the rest of the Orange Box, Team Fortress 2 is a multiplayer game that has been around for 10 years, and yet it's retained a player base many never reached to begin with. It's one of the most recognizable shooters ever made, even to those who've never played a match of 2 Fort in their life, and it's in large part due to the updates and support this game has had over those 10 years. This introduces a problem, because while I really enjoyed Team Fortress 2, it never became my go-to shooter. The 40 hours I spent with Team Fortress 2 on PC took place around 2009, before the game became free to play. As a result, it's impossible to view the game's multiplayer as I did with Halo or Mass Effect 3, games I experienced the evolution of directly. TF2 has thousands of regulars who've played for thousands of hours, and they're the experts when it comes to balance, content, and updates, not me. Regardless, let's tackle this game as the filthy casual I am. What's fascinating about Team Fortress 2 is that it's always had to deal with overwhelming new players. Most competitive shooters in 2007 had unified base gameplay. Even class-based titles like Battlefield shared weapons and movement speeds across its different soldiers. Team Fortress 2 has more classes and more distinction within them through movement, animations, personalities, and playstyles. On top of that, not a single one fits within the AR Everyman archetype. Aware that only Team Fortress fans would instantly recognize the game's design, Valve poured countless hours into alleviating its complexity without a sacrifice too great. We've already discussed the change in art style, allowing the developers to make characters more expressive compared to their realistic counterparts. 
but it goes deeper than that. Streamline has become a dirty term in modern gaming due to its overuse in the seventh console generation, but TF2 was a great example of this practice done properly. Seven of the nine classes only carry three selections with them during gameplay. Their original fourth option, grenades, were also removed. Not only was keeping track of the different grenade types difficult, it hurt the flow of gameplay. Combat became more about knowing where to spam explosives rather than confronting the enemy. It's quite amusing that the orange box claims to feature all new game modes because I believe TF2 echoes Portal of framing their unique core gameplay within familiarity. Capture the flag and control point were staples in multiplayer gaming, and it helped players instantly recognize the role of each class. Engineers protected objectives, or vital points on the map. Scouts flanked and pestered enemies. Heavies took and gave damage. And just like Portal, going back to Team Fortress 2's original launch is almost underwhelming in its simplicity. In today's world of MOBAs and hero shooters, Team Fortress 2 is easy to pick up and play, which is a testament to its strengths and influence. What's intimidating about the game today isn't the core, but everything that surrounds it. Stores, unlocks, contracts, blueprints, crafting, trading, editing, stats, and achievements. It's understandable as a free-to-play game, but the premium membership for current supporters or those who bought the launch game doesn't convert the complication. At first glance, this validates the mockery against TF2, that it's a case study in games which grow to become a digital Frankenstein that no longer resemble the foundation. But it's never that simple. The character-based craze TF2 ignited has a consistency in their post-launch support. Base characters or classes are created and left to be. Reinhardt's tweaks don't change how he's played. Capcan's new traps fit within his intended role. The evolution comes from new characters with their own intentions and abilities. Team Fortress 2 doesn't do that. Its number of classes haven't changed. Their potential has. Remember when I said engineers protected vital points on the map? Suggesting they're meant to stand back and support. Well, with the option to create and directly control many sentries, this defender can be reconfigured into an aggressor. The demo man can still sit and spam, but he can also charge selected targets for a melee kill. The scout pesters enemies, but with one beverage, can become Speedo Sound Sonic, bypassing the engineers and mines that stopped him before. Playing TF2 without these additions really does fit the word vanilla. It's perfectly fine, but you feel there's something missing, and what's missing is variation in playstyle. Encountering one class isn't the same thing every time. You can't spot a demo man far away and relax. You need to prepare for him to potentially get up in your face. But crucially, regardless of playstyle, you need to bide your time. The tactics I mentioned can only be achieved when a window of opportunity presents itself. Charging as demo or flanking a scout isn't without risk. You need to scrutinize the enemy's positioning and playstyle before making your move, which makes your success that much more rewarding. Now, there are a couple caveats. First off, this is all in the context of Tia 2's bread and butter. 8v8 or 12v12 clusterfuck casual matches. When you examine the game under a competitive lens, which Valve has invited themselves to, issues crop up. For instance, the Spy is a class that thrives in the online environment TF2 established. Vast lobbies and a perpetual cacophony of explosions, and gamers who aren't allowed to play Counter-Strike yet. It's here that posing as enemies and backstabbing them is a possibility. But a 6v6 competitive match with full squads on either side makes this almost impossible. It's not just in competitions that dictate the use of certain picks, though. It also depends on which game type you're in. I originally used ambushing with Pyro as an example of knowing when to strike, but in Payload, that opportunity is whenever the card is close to your spawn. Trust me, this MVP badge was very undeserved. Capture the Flag is by far the weakest when it comes to these forced rolls, which might explain why it only has four maps compared to everything else having seven or more. The class variety mentioned is staunchly neutered by nature. Engineers must place their turrets and teleporters in the most predictable spots, as without said placement, scouts, soldiers, and spies will just take their objective. Snipers have to watch from vantage points, as aggressively pushing is better led to someone less specialized. Based on TF2's success in other modes, you'd think that CTF would be one flag, but it's not. Levels are entirely symmetrical. No time limit exists, so rounds last for an eternity. And when victory is finally achieved, it's less to do with overcoming challenges and more with your enemies losing their will. It's baffling because symmetrical modes in TF2 can work, proven by King of the Hill and Control Point. The mere existence of time pressure gives each capture some weight and meaning. The quick captures of Control Point make every push exciting as it has the potential to be your last, and King of the Hill builds itself towards clutch saves and devastating losses. 
The easiest to pick up and play, however, are Payload and Attack and Defense. These asymmetrical arenas and casual settings don't require every play to be substantial in order to be a game changer. In CETF, you can't steal the intelligence without a specific approach if the defense is strong enough. But in Payload, burning multiple players, sabotaging one turret, or weakening a medic is what gives you a few more feet with the bomb, or puts you one step closer to the capture point. Payload's popularity as a game type stems from knowing exactly how much you as a team have done collectively. Almost delivering the bomb doesn't feel like failure in the same way an unreached capture point does. Similar to what I said about Half-Life, this tangibility makes certain game types murder any sense of time. The most surprising thing from my time spent with a game, however, is how much its core gameplay has been retained. Default weapons aren't slouches and can prove to be devastating even if you're not an expert. And most of the alternatives come with notable downsides that if they don't make the weapon unappealing, does make one consider their options. The key word is most. And now that we've talked about the game portion of TF2, it's time to talk about what surrounds it. Weapons available to the different classes are often just the base gun with occasionally sensible but mostly bizarre twists. What I realize with post-launch weaponry is the interaction with them is simple. This extinguisher, only use it when targets are set on fire. Easy. It's looking at traits that the game overwhelms. This isn't just an AK to an M16. This weapon has 25% more projectile speed and does 25% more damage against buildings, but it has 25% lower mag size with a 25% decreased explosive radius. That's not always the case though, and damage dealers like the Backburner are quite one-sided. Hmm, what's more valuable? Critical hits on ambushed enemies, which as Pyro is kind of the point of his character, or more ammo for the ability I use once every few lives. Now, what I came to accept is while this game's weapon and item sandbox is like trying to crack Enigma, I never felt while playing that there were weapons I couldn't outplay or drag the pace of the game. No equivalent of Armor Lock, the Sniper 90, or MP40 Drum Mag. So I don't think the system is bad, just bewildering. Crafting, however, is a joke. Hey, do you want to craft this gun? Well, you're going to need to use the blueprint to craft scrap metal with two items from one class three times so that you can use the three scrap metal pieces to make refined metal, which you then use as one part to craft a weapon that requires an already existing item in your inventory to create the thing you wanted in the first place. While navigating a menu that isn't listed by release, class, or even alphabetical, nor allow searches, even though the store where you buy the same items instead of crafting allow you to do each of those things. It's small wonder why trading is so big in this game, when your other options for items are loot boxes, direct payment, or this pile of garbage. Okay, that's not completely true. You can unlock some of the most vital and useful unlocks through achievements, which is cordial. Or it would be if the game ever explained this. I understand to a veteran this may seem like a joke, and there's been plenty of servers where you can get all the items with just a chat command. But put yourself in the mind of someone who's just installed this game for the first time. When is this information ever given to you? In fact, this leads into one of the biggest problems with Team Fortress 2. It's 10 years old and has seemingly made no effort to invite players. The shift towards matchmaking over custom servers with a focus on competitive play leads to Overwatch being blamed. And while I'm sure Blizzard has inspired Valve, TF2's recent evolution is more likely encouraged by their own games, the most popular of which rely heavily on matchmaking and competitive play. This is all theory, but what's more likely? Valve incorporating what works best for their biggest successes into Team Fortress, or plagiarizing Overwatch, but only two parts of it. Valve's recent announcement of the Artifact card game is what probably gave that impression. Big publishers follow trends because they believe it's what will generate higher profits for shareholders that they must please. But Valve listens to no one. They take from themselves. Live streaming from Counter-Strike and Dota was added to Team Fortress 2. Just like Portal adopted hats, Counter-Strike uses crates, and Dota 2 has the Steam Workshop. Valve has been developing concepts for years and using their franchises to advance them. But while Counter-Strike and Dota found suitable ways of incorporating TF2's monetization, Team Fortress doesn't fit within Valve's current model of success. Dota and Counter-Strike are vastly different experiences depending on what level you're playing in, but the game itself, its rules, mechanics, weapons, and items are the same. That's not what TF2 is. I've spent enough hours in Halo 2 and heard enough of Super Smash Melee to know a rule set doesn't need to be identical to the core game to generate traffic. But these are very different scenarios compared to Team Fortress. Competitive gaming was much smaller when Halo 2 began to stream and televise MLG events. 
in Super Smash Bros. Melee was lightning in a bottle to the point of a GameCube launch title being used at EVO today. It's not a 10-year-old FPS whose developer avoided competition at the frustration of competitive players until Valve realized the potential of esports and wants to implement it, despite spending seven years not designing anything with the intent of the game being so. I'm reminded of a story. Leet World was the red vs. blue of Counter-Strike, attaching hilarious and distinct personalities and voices to what were just skins. But unlike Red vs. Blue, there were no endorsements or DVDs. Because to quote Valve directly to another Machinima studio, We are not interested in licensing our technology or IP for Machinima. This includes providing copyright approvals. And what did Valve do two years after this? Release Source Filmmaker. Reversing decisions made in the past isn't new at Valve Software. Team Fortress 2 is simply the latest product to be handled as such. This game is confusing, because with all of its controversy in the community and adjustments over the years, what remains is a great game underneath confusion and a lack of accessibility. Team Fortress 2 is vast, overwhelming, and hypnotic, positively and negatively, but ultimately for the better. It's not and may never be my go-to shooter, but I completely understand why it is for so many. The orange box itself is a thing of the past. Valve's single-player games can be picked up for less than a dollar during sales, so other than archival purposes, there isn't much reason to purchase it today. Rather, the orange box represents what Valve stood for. In a time where big publishers relied on quick and disposable income and the artists let or closed down, Valve not only survived, but thrived with quality and care. Delays were never due to incompetence, but love a desire to ensure that the release of their latest lived up to the standards set by the past. In the eyes of gamers, Valve could do no wrong. Frustrations with Steam, retractions from Half-Life, or hats in Team Fortress were minuscule compared to the monument of trust and success the company had. But for Valve themselves, there was a cost. Gabe Newell has said that 2012 to 2015 was some of the most fun the company had in its entire history. I don't believe it's controversial to say that isn't mutual with Valve's fans. And for good reason. When Half-Life 2 came out, gamers didn't experience the sleepless nights, weeks, and months. The embarrassment of their privacy being exposed, the business politics, and continued mistakes that couldn't be reversed after six years in development. As always, we only got the product, or in the case of games like Half-Life 2, the art. Valve made that commitment. And looking back at the orange box, criticisms and all, it's something to commend and celebrate. But in learning from the trials and tribulations, swinging the pendulum from years of silence to monthly posts, large teams to small teams, single player to multiplayer, something has been lost. Valve has done many great things, from innovating in virtual reality, making its entire Dota cast free to all, and involving the community with some of their biggest games. However, the romance in one group sacrificing their funding in hell for the sake of an art form is gone. Truthfully, it might have never existed. Valve were never one large entity, frustrations with Steam's functionality have existed from day one, and niche groups weren't treated as equally as others. But their game spoke louder than any of those truths. Valve were known for their results, and now they're known for their business. Grateful for the results, I don't hate them. I miss them. Normally, my research consists of scouring for developer interviews behind the scenes or articles written by journalists in the industry. It can make you feel like an investigator, searching for details with information others used for promotion or payment. But for this video, I am completely outclassed by the Valve community. The amount of research and dedication they have to this company's games and services is unparalleled, and I absolutely wouldn't have been able to do this video without their hard work. Despite this being my longest and most ambitious video to date, I feel like I've only scratched the surface. I highly recommend checking out Bollocks, Valve News Network, Escalation, Rick, and Examine Life of Gaming for videos that delve into far greater detail than I ever could. And special thanks to Sparky for making the thumbnail, and Sergeant Strawberry for assisting me in the writing process. Who do you like more, Captain Picard or Captain Kirk? I'm not really that familiar with either of them, so Commander Shepard. Which Rainbow Six operator is best waifu? Elite Twitch or Kavera? Don't kink shame. 
What you get for Christmas. 14 new cousins. Have you ever played Hearts of Iron 4? Nope, but I have watched it. And it's pretty entertaining to watch the game cripple underneath its own weight. Would the Mass Effect trilogy have had a better or more well-received ending had it gone the route of the original Star Wars trilogy and just have a happy, satisfying ending where the good guys win? Additionally, what would you have preferred? It would only have a better ending in terms of retrospect. If we were to go to a world where Mass Effect 3's ending never happened and all we got was a cliché ending, then the series wouldn't be very notable and it probably would have faded into obscurity. Or at the very least, its ending would have been considered a disappointment just because of the quality of the two games that preceded it. I would have preferred it in the same way I'd prefer a protein shake compared to mud. Will there be a critical mass when it comes to the player-publisher relationship where bad publishers finally hit a wall of declining profits, or will people continuously buy the new COD games regardless of quality? The thing to remember about player-publisher relationships is that only the hardcore gamer crowd is going to care about it, and that gaming is mainstream enough at its moment so that that relationship wouldn't completely cripple a company. If there's any way I can describe it, think of any industry, food, or item that you're not particularly interested in and would accept a low-quality product from just out of ignorance, and put that to your favorite medium of video games. There's millions of people that are completely A-OK -okay with something like Call of Duty World War II. Mediocrity makes money, as long as you sell it right. Why does my PP come out yellow? Gatorade? What's the best MGS boss fight throughout the series? The boss, without question, because she's an actual formidable enemy. And having to fight against another human being that uses tactics like you to defeat you is something that I wish more video games would pursue. When are you going to publish more of your crappy fanfics like your Stalker Call of Chernobyl video? It'll happen whenever I start streaming. Maybe. When is the next Siege video? When I feel like making Total Biscuit tweet. When is the community play session of genital jousting happening? I love you guys.